you're not a big spicy food guy, right? Yeah, I eat heck out of some spice stuff. I go through about bottle Cholula hot sauce like once a month. Then why <laughs> is it, do you think, that you gravitate towards the sweet whiskeys and you tend to... Because I eat a watermelon like once a week. <laughs> 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 There's a chopped up watermelon in the refrigerator right now. Welcome to another trip down the bourbon road with your hosts, Jim and Mike. So grab a glass of your favorite bourbon and kick back. We would like to thank Tommy and Gwen Mitchell from Loggerheads Home Center for supporting this episode of the bourbon road. Find out more about their fine rustic furniture at logheadshomecenter.com. Hello, everybody. I'm Jim Shannon. And I'm Mike Hyatt. And this is the Bourbon Road. And Mike, where are we today? Back out here at Jep the Bend Farm in Shelbyville, Kentucky. In the heart of horse country. Yeah. Well, bourbon country for Bourbon us. country. Horse and bourbon country. Horses and bourbon, yep. And what else? Deer hunting, right? Isn't that that well, time of year now? It is that time of year. You know, I'm getting excited about it, too. <laughs> you know, I start getting those trail cam pictures and stuff, and I'm like, wow, look at that thing. Well, I'm pretty excited about who's with us today. Yeah, I am too. Uh, we had reviewed their whiskey a couple weeks ago and released it. And I was lucky enough that somebody reached out to me about it and said, hey, thanks for the review. And so we're having Woodenville Whiskey's national brand ambassador on today, Ariel Yan. And she's actually a Kentucky girl. Ariel, welcome home to Kentucky. Thank you. It is great to be here, and I appreciate being on the show. And before we get too far talking about whiskey, I want to thank you both for your service. Thanks. We oh, appreciate thank you that. very much. Very nice. Well, we are so happy to have you here and sharing your whiskey with us. And uh, Mike, we don't like to spend a whole lot of time chit and chatting up front. I like to get straight to the bottle, right? I know. And Ariel is awesome. She brings three bottles to my house for me. That's that's some amazing stuff. We're right going to talk about them two two of them today. Maybe mention the third one, right? Yeah, and then uh, yeah. So why don't you tell us what you have in the first bottle for us today? Yes, of course. Well, we have our Woodenville Straight Bourbon Whiskey, which I know you're not supposed to pick favorites, just like you're not supposed to have favorite child. But I have to say the bourbon is my favorite. And I think mostly because I am a Kentucky girl born and raised. I was gone before I could legally drink, though, but kept that heritage, you know. As soon as I turned 21, I dived straight into bourbon. So, of course, I have a lot of favorites out there outside of Woodenville, and that's what I cut my teeth on and then fell into the bourbon world in Washington State and now get to sell and talk about Woodenville in Kentucky, which is awesome. So our bourbon whiskey is our flagship product. The whole reason Woodenville was created. It is a five-year-old bourbon whiskey made with all Washington grain. So our two founders, Brett and Orland, were best friends and had a dream to make Washington whiskey with the best ingredients that they could, but honor the time old tradition of bourbon. So this is 72% corn, 22% rye, and 6% malted barley, bottled at 90 proof. And our barrels are coming from Independent Stave Company in Lebanon, Missouri. So we took some best wine practices for those barrels. We do it 18 to 24 month seasoning of the wood, heavy toast and heavy tar. So at five years old, you should get quite a bit of flavor. And of course, that high rye content brings through quite a bit of those baking spice notes. Okay. Well, Mike, let's check it out. It's got a great nose on it. I was sitting here nosing it while she was explaining all that to us. Definitely a great smelling bourbon. Floral and that caramel is coming out big time in this. Yeah, I mean, I'm getting a lot of oak influence on the nose. I think it's taken on a lot of barrel attributes. And you say it's five-year-old, so we would expect a little bit of that, but not a large amount. So are these, these are full-size barrels? They are, 53 gallons. Okay. Back in the day when we first started, because we were 100% grain to glass distillery, we did have eight-gallon barrels, but we've phased out that bourbon in 2015. So... So this bourbon, let's talk about Woodenville and where Woodenville is in Washington State, because most people will probably think Washington State is just the coast. And there's a lot of different climates in Washington State. So where's Woodenville at? Yes. Yeah, so Woodenville is right outside of Seattle, about 20 miles from downtown. 
So you get that gray, rainy weather for nine months out of the year that you would think of for Seattle or most of Washington. I remember the first time I went out to Quincy, Washington, where the Almond Family Farm is. That's where we get all of our grain and we age our whiskey. I went out about eight months after we had moved there and was shocked. It was crazy. After you go over the Cascade Mountains into eastern Washington, it's all high desert. Looks like Mars, if I was going to guess what Mars looked like with all these crazy rock formations, hardly any trees around. Of course, there's a lot of grapes being grown and grain and apple trees, but it is wild to go from western Washington, where you think of Washington State, very green, and then eastern Washington, which is all that high desert. What do you think about that nose, Jim? Yeah, so that's a very rich nose. It does have a lot of barrel influence on it. I would say that's my predominant note there is I'm getting a lot of oak and caramel, and um, I'm getting that rice spice as well. Uh, but the rice spice is coming across more, I don't know, a little bit more, um, not so much like a minty rice spice, although I, I pick up a little bit of mint in the nose, but not too much. I'm getting a little whorehound in there. Yeah. Uh, uh, sassafras, a root beer. Ariel looked at me like, "What's a, what's whorehound?" I heard you talking about the candies <laughs> on one of the podcasts recently. So, yeah. <laughs> and one of our ambassadors in Florida, Shana Kaufman, has used them to make bitters. And I was very curious what it tastes like on its own. So I'll have to seek that out. Tractor supply. Perfect. Yeah, there's plenty of them around, and, and they all carry whorehounds, and they have some of the old anise candies, and um. Some of the old mint candies. Lemon drops. Lemon drops. Yeah. yeah. The real ones. Yeah. Well, let's taste this thing. Let's taste it. Wow. That's good. That is exactly like the nose. I'd say it matches it perfectly. It's sweetness on that front, that 70, would you say 74% corn? 72%. 72% corn is, it definitely comes out. The corn does. And that ride just kind of rides on the back of your tongue a little bit just like like peppermint maybe mm-hmm. yeah there's definitely mint on the on the palate I, I just got a little bit of it on the nose but definitely on the palate it's giving me that nice cool peppermint burst on my on my tongue pretty nice like maybe one of those uh lifesaver mint breaths breath mints um, that's winter what I, fresh, winter fresh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I just, you get that. It is a refreshing bourbon. I think it's not overpowering or anything. And this is 90 proof. 90 proof. So is that the standard for everything? No yes. cast strength stuff you guys are putting out? For our three core products, our bourbon rye and our port finished bourbon, which you all have had, it is 90 proof. And we do have cast strength available as a single barrel a program around the country. But for any cast strength whiskeys, it is at our tasting room. Hopefully our listeners will ask us to do a pick from there. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's not too far to go, right, Mike? Just 2,500 miles? Yeah, we'd probably go out there and do a little fly fishing. and Just don't go right now. It's a little smoky. A little smoky. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that might be an understatement, but. <laughs> so is that the direction of the wind? Sort of. I think uh, the whole West Coast right now is, it's very windy. So it's moving. I don't know which direction it's coming from since there's so many fires out there, but moving the wind in every which direction. And it's pretty stagnant in some areas. It looks very apocalyptic. It makes beautiful sunsets though in Kentucky. Yes. It's amazing what that that those smoke particles do in the in the atmosphere is they mm-hmm. create beautiful. Well, it's, it's not a good thing that's happening there. Let's not make light of it. Yeah, yeah. But um, we do get some beautiful sunsets from that smoke as it moves eastward. Yes, it's pretty crazy. I I believe I've seen one or two over the last few years when I've traveled back this way, and it's crazy because it's kind of hazy, but then the colors just burst across the the sky. So tell us a little bit about Woodenville Distillery. You know, when was it founded? You said they started out with eight-gallon barrels, but who founded Woodenville Distillery? Yeah, so in 2010, Brett Carlisle and Orlin Sorensen, our two founders, started the distillery. We say that's our official founding date because that's when we had our first distillation, but the pen to paper was put down before that. So the laws changed in 2008 where you could legally distill in Washington for the first time since prohibition. So it's pretty crazy. Those laws stuck around for almost 80 years before any legal distillation was happening in the state. You know, I'm sure there was someone, but they're still at home doing some good stuff, but for legal pen to, or, you know, anything legal, 
it was 2008 for that to happen. So in 2010, we were one of the first five distilleries in the state, which is pretty crazy. Now there's over 100. So in 10 years, it's boomed. And we are now the largest distillery in the state. We have been filling about seven and a half barrels a day. Um, The first few years were a little smaller than that. We kind of grew into that. And we've been under expansion the last few months. So soon we'll be at 25 barrels a day unless we go to 24-hour distillation and we could do up to 50. So still the largest in Washington, but that's drops in the bucket to any Kentucky or Tennessee distillery. So uh, tell us a little bit about your stills. So you're producing on... A combination pot still, hybrid still, or um, do you have a column alone as well? It is a combination pot and column. We get it from the Coda Company in Stuttgart, Germany. We originally had the same style still, but it was a thousand liters. And then six years ago, we moved into our current location, which is about a mile down the road from where we were. And if you were standing in our parking lot, you'd see Shot to St. Michelle Columbia Winery and then our beautiful still from the parking lot. And it is 5,000 liters now and we do two batches every day. So each batch from filling the still to emptying it out takes about six hours. Okay. So liters to gallons for those who are trying to do the math in their head, it's about a four to one. Yes. I think it's 1,300 gallons if okay. I, yes, if I can do my math correctly. Yeah, since it comes from Germany, it's plastered on the side, the 5,000 liters. That's what I always picture when I'm thinking of the still. So are you guys doing a sweet mash or sour mash? A sweet mash every time. And was there a reason for that? Well, we didn't have a, I guess, a, you know, somebody's old yeast strain from, you know, generations down the line. We wanted to make sure that we could control that, especially with all the natural flora and fauna that's in Woodenville, since there are 100 wineries producing wine, and then also quite a few breweries and distilleries. So to make sure that every day the yeast was staying the same and not changing too drastically. And then we also uh, wanted to make sure we could have a clean run every time um, and make, I guess, for consistency. That's why they chose that. I guess if you wanted to in that in that type of area, you don't even need to buy your own yeast. There's plenty in the air, right? I there mean- is plenty in the air. So uh, we had uh, Dr. Bill Lumsden from Glenmore and Jane Ardbeg Distillery come out and when we were thinking about an expansion a few years ago, and he has his doctorate in yeast studies and said, if we were to ever make Woodenville whiskey anywhere else, it would never taste the same because we have all that natural yeast in the air. So we don't do a fully closed fermentation, but we do inoculate it every time with our yeast. And then you have that natural yeast in the air. Okay. So the tops of your fermenters are open. Yes. But they've got that carbon dioxide layer up there that kind of protects them a little bit. Yes. Okay. That's pretty awesome. This this bourbon is is fantastic. And last week, me and Jim did a podcast where we kind of talked about the basics of bourbon and the differences between sour mash and sweet mash. And this is definitely on that level with sweet mash, right? Being a sweet mash, it doesn't give you that Kentucky hug as much. So it doesn't really get you right here in the top of the chest. Yeah, it'll give you that nice bite on the tongue. But not that I call acid reflux where you wake up in the middle of the night and I'll go, oh, good Lord. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has got a nice finish to it. I would say it's a medium finish, Mike. Would you agree? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. Yeah, it's, and uh, it's, it's got a nice spice on the, on the back end. I like it. It sort of it keeps it kind of keeps the fires lit back there a little bit. I'm, I'm wondering what this would taste like at 100 or 110 or 120. Well, I'll have to get y'all some of our cast strength that usually comes out about 120 proof because we are filling our barrels at 110 proof. Okay, so you've got a fairly low in- barrel entry proof. We do, yes. And have you been doing it that way since the beginning? We have. Okay. Even when we were in the eight gallon barrels, uh, we did that lower proof and then we transferred that over when we started filling all of our 53 gallon barrels. So, is all of your earlier stocks, are they all gone now or? Yes, we released our first full size barrel last January. And from that, we've just been bottling everything almost as soon as it gets to that five year old mark. Okay. So, do you have older stocks of anything? Not right now, unless yeah. there's a hidden barrel or two that we haven't found in the Rick house. Somebody's stashed one away. I I'm think. sure they have. <laughs> so is the is the plan to 
go up in age as the distillery gets older? Yes, it is. So now that we're under expansion, we're going to definitely start to up age stuff as we have whiskeys coming online, more and more whiskey that we can bottle at five years. We want it to be a natural growth. Um, and we were only in Washington up until two years ago. So it's been fairly new that we've even launched other states. So we're trying to slowly grow the brand. And that's why we're releasing everything at five years right now. So that as we get bigger, we can release more expressions. You don't want to out kick your coverage, right? Exactly. Well, that's, I think that's that's pretty awesome that you, you kind of stay with the plans of other craft distilleries out there that are doing that same thing, that they're not out kicking that coverage. You're making sure you have enough whiskey for your sales throughout the states. Um, I, I just love your guys' marketing because even on your website, it says we don't have a hundred-year-old story. It's you are who you are. Um, you got your own bottle style. It's a beautiful bottle to me. I like that little short, stubby square bottles. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to think of what some other bottles it might look like uh, in shape wise. I mean, it, I think it's different than any of them, but uh, it's sort of shaped like a like a Luxro bottle or a, uh, maybe a, a little bit like a Wilderness Trail bottle. That's what I was going to say, Wilderness yeah. Trail. And you know, if you if you're going to do anything, you're going to not try to recreate another bourbon brand and stuff, but that's a pretty good bourbon brand too. Uh, they're on the rise, just like you guys are. Um, yes, they're doing some great stuff. I was surprised um, when you guys reached out to us. That was about the same time that you guys had launched here in Kentucky. Now, what was that like launching in your home state? It was pretty crazy. I would have to say it was uh, not as exciting as it could have been because at that point it was still pretty much quarantine. And so we did our launch with our distributor over Zoom, which is hard to make connections with people and all that. I know I was excited and told family, you know, go, go out and buy some because I know you all love it when I bring it to you. But we haven't really done any big events or anything like that, which I think, you know, getting liquid to lips is always one of the best ways. People probably haven't heard from about Woodinville unless, you know, they're watching or reading articles about bourbon news across the country. Um, so we hope to do more as things continually open up. We're listening to podcasts, right? Yeah. So we're listening to podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been, I've been hearing about Woodinville whiskey now for probably a couple of years, maybe. And uh, through, you know, the podcast, through watching other uh, media uh, through reading and it's always good. It's always good reviews. It's always great. Um, great talk about you guys. There's a lot of respect for you out there. I don't hear a lot of naysayers. So I think that you've garnered a great deal of respect across the nation, even prior to leaving Washington state. Yes. Well, thank you. And I, I think a big piece of that is people who came to Washington, you know, there's some great whiskey bars out there too, and asking for new things and especially the tourism in general of bourbon and booze around the country, I think has helped garner a lot. We've had a lot of people come into the tasting room too, who have been out for wineries in Washington and it's surprising to me. We'll come in the tasting room and say, I've never been to a distillery or I've never had whiskey. I don't know where they have been, but <laughs> they'll come in and try whiskey for the first time or see a distillery and how things are made, which is really cool that we can, I guess, claim people from the wine world and take them over to the whiskey world. So does Washington have does the state of Washington, do they have a Washington whiskey trail or their talk about I believe there is talk about this. I should probably know it better. Uh, locally in Woodinville in the town of Bothell, we had a craft distillers trail going on because there were quite a few distilleries. Uh, some of them were rum. There was another uh, two bourbon distilleries, I believe, a vodka and aquavit distillery and uh, schnapps, it, beer schnapps, if you can believe that. Uh -oh. And so we had a, a little map that people could go visit these 10 distilleries, you know, within a couple mile radius of each other. Now, they're not the first Washington distiller we've had on the show, Mike. No, oh, I think they're either the second or third. I would tell you this, that whenever I first started with a podcast last year, actually. Yeah. It's been one year for me, Jim. Congratulations. Happy birthday. One year. Yes, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> um, me and Jim sat down and we talked about what distilleries we really wanted to have on and kind of what our format was going to be, because he already had a, a successful podcast. but. We wanted to make it better. So, and one of the first 
brands he brought up to me. He's like, man, Mike, we really got to get Woodenville on the podcast. And in my mind, you know, I'm starting on the podcast. I'm like, well, how are we going to get out to Washington State? <laughs> it's a well, long ways. We are the bourbon road. Yeah, we are. We are. But sometimes that bourbon road leads to us. It does. Yeah. Yes. Like, like today. Yeah. Serendipity. Lucky us. <laughs> Well, Jim, what do you, what's your final take on? Yeah. So, uh, this is, um, f- this is for me a well, a well crafted bourbon. It's well rounded. I think it, uh, the nose and the palate match pretty well. I love that, um, that hint of mint that you get on the nose just a little bit. And then the, the impression of it on the palate is 10 times that. I like that. It's kind of refreshing. I would say I might lean out there and say it's a summer sipper. With that refreshing taste, I kind of like that. I'm going to call this a Faith Hill whiskey is what I'm going to call it. Faith Hill. Yeah. Get back to my country roots here with this. But Faith Hill, <laughs> um, just because it is kind of refreshing to hear something a little bit different. It's got that 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 little kick on the tongue and stuff. I really like it. Um, it's got a note in there or something else I'm tasting as it's opened up a little bit as it's been in my glass. I'm trying to think what that exactly is. Maybe a little bit, maybe because it is from Washington. And when I was a kid, I always assumed that all apples came from Washington State. So maybe I'm getting a little bit of like apple licorice on this. Just a hint of it. Yeah, for me, I would say predominantly um, like sassafras, mint mint sassafras kind of. But I love the 90 proof. I think it was a good choice. I definitely think that was a good choice. I haven't had the cast strength, but I will say this. It's. It's a great sipper at this proof. For me, I would definitely have this on my bar. I would definitely share it with a friend. And I wouldn't be opposed to giving a bottle away to somebody who didn't get it, couldn't get it or wasn't able to get it. What's this what's this retail for? Uh $39.99 is our suggested retail price. So I think that's a really fair um, retail price for anybody going out there, especially buying a gift. I actually saw this buddy that's retiring after 34 years in the U S coast guard. And he asked me what kind of gift would I get somebody if they liked bourbon for his guest speaker? And I said, well, I would probably, cause I'd know the person he's buying for. I said, I'd probably get him a bottle of your guys's Woodenville port. Cause he likes finished whiskeys. So you know, for me to say that, and I could, I mean, you see what I have on the shelf. I could say many different whiskeys, but I really fell in love with your, your guys' port whiskey. It, it was really good. And this is just as good. Yeah. I think that price point is excellent. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate that. And the honor of being suggested to, especially for such an incredible occasion. Absolutely. Well, Mike, I think we're about up to the break here. So um, we both have a little bit more in our glasses. Why don't we keep sipping on it? And uh, we'll take a short break. And when we come back, you have something else for us. Yes, I do. We would like to thank Tommy and Gwen Mitchell from Logheads Home Center for supporting this episode of The Bourbon Road. Logheads Home Center, nestled in the hills of Kentucky, is an industry leader in building handcrafted rustic furniture. Family owned and operated, they take pride in offering only the very best for their customers. The Logheads, and that's what they like to call themselves, are skilled wood crafters who are passionate about creating rustic furniture for people who appreciate the beauty of natural wood. Owners Tommy and Gwen don't just sell the rustic lifestyle, they live it. And you can be sure that Logheads Furniture will always be handcrafted in Kentucky by artisans who embrace the simple way of life. Logheads Rustic Furniture is made from northern white cedar, a sustainable wood that's naturally rot and termite resistant. Its beauty and quality will add warmth to your earthy lifestyle for generations to come. Be sure to check out everything they have to offer at logheadshomecenter.com. And while you're at it, give Tommy and Gwen a shout on Facebook or Instagram at Logheads Home Center. All right, well, we are back and uh, we are ready for the second half. 
And Ariel, what do you have for us? Yes, I have the second flagship whiskey that we have. It's our 100% rye whiskey. So very unique that it's a 100% rye mash bill. It is made the same exact way as our bourbon, though. So they both come off the still at 140 proof, barreled at 110 proof, and bottled at 90 proof. But even on the nose, you can tell the difference right away. There's a lot of baking spices that I get that come through, not so much the black pepper that I'm used to in a rye whiskey. And I think a lot of that is the grain that we're using. It's a baker's grade of rye. Arnie Omlin, our farmer, went to the local bakery and asked him what rye flour he used. And now um, the almonds are actually the largest rye producers in the state of Washington, which is pretty cool. Okay, so rye in general can be kind of a tricky grain to distill with. Yes. And to uh, and I guess in the fermentation tanks, it tends not to play well, right? It does not play very well at all. I've heard some horror stories and seen some videos of the rye mash overflowing from our two-story fermenter tanks um, as a rye whiskey mash waterfall. It uh, doesn't smell very great and, of course, very messy. So we do have to, you know, do some extra love, I guess, TLC on it. We use anti-foam, a.k.a. vegetable oil, to break up the tension on the surface so that it ferments and bubbles beside each other and not on top of each other. And then, of course, a lot of people ask if we use enzymes or any malted rye, and we do use non-GMO enzymes for that 100%. Okay. Well, because you kind of need to, right? Yes, of course. So you're, there's no malted rye in this. This is 100% just non-malted rye. Non-malted rye. Got to have something to kick those enzymes, right? Yes. Right. And it is very messy in the still as well. Have to do a little extra cleaning. Take some elbow grease and, of course, doesn't provide as much whiskey in one run on the still. That's more in that two and a half to three barrels a day that we or per run we get. Well, Mike, I'm really looking forward to this. This is kind of my jam, as you know. And uh, I'm ready. I'm not ready. You know, I, I, it's like I'm being forced to drink rye all the time now. It's James should be ashamed of himself. I never get to drink wheat whiskey anymore, or wheat bourbon anymore. It hurts my soul. Yeah, I, I think he's. <laughs> I think he's holding on tight to that to that wheat whiskey because every time we do another podcast and there's another rye on there, Mike inches a little bit more into the rye zone, and I think I'll, I'll be honest with you. A year from now, Mike. Mm-hmm. I've heard you say I love this rye about five times this year already. I love whiskey. You know, I'm a whiskey lover, but <laughs> I love women. But you know, Vivian was my wife, so I'm always love her. Well, more. you know, let's be fair about this. Whiskey is not all that different from food, meaning that your palate is your palate. You like what you like. Some people like spicy food. Some people don't. You're not a big spicy food guy, right? Yeah, I eat the heck out of some spice stuff. I go through about bottle of Cholula hot sauce. Once a month. Then why <laughs> is it, do you think, that you gravitate towards the sweet whiskeys and you tend to... Because I eat a watermelon like once a week. <laughs> 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 There's a chopped up watermelon in the refrigerator right now. All right. Well, I want, I'm want. i ready to give this its due. Well, hold on. Let me say what, what the nose is here, Jeff. All right. You got it. I had a little bit of black licorice on this and mm-hmm. some heavy floral, almost like a really good rose scent to it. Jim's like, what the heck? Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm getting, uh, I'm definitely getting a lot more mint this time. I'm getting a little bit of, uh, cedar spice, a little bit, a little bit of spicy Mm. cedar, but it's, it does have that, uh, juniper berry, that baking spice with it though. So it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of a, 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 yeah, juniper berry. I don't know if it's, if it's, I'd go that far, but definitely a little bit of cedar. We'll go out there and get some juniper cedar, uh, juniper cedar, I guess, is what I'm thinking. Those little black berries that are on there, you take those and roll them around your hand. All right. Yeah. Well, um, but it's but it's definitely got a nice sweetness on it, too. A little bit of spice, but it's more that uh, that aromatic floral spice like you were talking about, Mike. Yes, very floral. You get some floral on I there? get a lot of floral on the nose today, especially. I and used red to say fruit, all, I think. Red fruit? Mm-hmm. I used to say all of the ryes because it's like the four, not one of the first ryes I tried, but on the show was uh, Sagamore. And then I ever rye drink, I was like, it smells like Sagamore. <laughs> <laughs> but no, now I pick up different notes and stuff out of the rye. So let's try. Jimmy you're already over there trying it on me. Beat me to the punch. Yeah, I beat you to the punch. I've been I've been working really hard to try and get to that point where I, I know. get my sip before you. Well, let's do it. Rye not. 
Yeah, definitely, definitely anise. I've got it. Cedar, cedar, anise, baking spice all day long. This is a, this is a, um, a rye muffin. Definitely like Ooh, a yes, rye muffin definitely. with uh, spicy butter on it. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you what I'm getting. What's that? I'm getting a nice biscuit with some honey butter. Yeah, there you go. A little bit of cinnamon honey butter. Yeah, that that sounds really good. Yeah, right sweet now. biscuit. There you go. I, it's super sweet on the tongue. What I would expect out of a rye might be the sweetest rye I've ever had, had before. Um, very honey forward. That little bit of that spice on the back end, but not as much as you would think, right? Exactly. I told you in the first half that bourbon was my favorite. I know you're not supposed to have it. And I do like the sweeter whiskeys as well. But our rye is one of the fewer I'm constantly surprised by. But I do have to say I might mix it in old fashioned more than the bourbon. Yeah. I would call this more of a dessert whiskey. Like after dinner or something really sweet. Man, I'm getting black walnut on the finish. Hmm. This honey's still sticking around. There's like a bee in there producing honey or something. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the anise is the anise is ever so present. It is. I didn't eat none of those anise candies that day. I gave them to you. I've yeah, I've gone through a half a bag of those already. Man. Half a bag. I gave him a half a bag of anise candy for his birthday, and I should have opened it up and just taped it back up or something. <laughs> gave, <laughs> gave it to him like regifted it or something. So, Harold, what is a brand ambassador? Yes. So I think that with different companies, brand ambassadors mean different things. Uh, for Woodenville, I am, we break it down into a couple different facets. I get, of course, of facets, I guess, excuse me. And so we work with our distributor quite a bit and educating them and working with them and daily sales. Of course, things are a little different right now with COVID. We can't go hit the streets with them. And then a lot of it is working with the consumers in trade. Of course, we want some bartenders and retail stores really pushing our product and I would say advocating for the brand when we can't be there. Knowing enough about it, they could answer some questions or maybe recommending us if people are looking for something new. And one of my favorite parts is traveling across the country to talk about the whiskey to different people, but really bonding with people over whiskey in an event um, fashion. So I would say either whiskey festivals that we've done or hosting dinners where you can talk with a chef and create this beautiful pairing dinner. Cause most people think, well, you know, you need to pair dinners with wine, but whiskey pairs great in a lot of different ways and either neat pours or cocktails paired with food. And so that's one of my favorite portions about being a brand ambassador is drinking whiskey, drinking whiskey, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you pair with this rye whiskey? This rye whiskey. Hmm. Well, today I'm tasting a lot of floral and baking spice notes. So it's, to me, really begging for, I don't know, first thing that comes to mind is like an apple turnover. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe have some of that, uh, what is it, flake sugar on top. Not okay. quite an icing, but uh, you'll get that little bit of crunch when you bite into the it. Cinnamon apple turnover? Yeah, cinnamon yeah. apple turnover. Speaking my language right there. And I would say I don't normally go for dessert. Most times I say bacon or pork or something like that. I'd only need about a gallon of milk with that, though. (laughs) (laughs) Just drinking it. So you obviously didn't just get hired as the national brand, you know, ambassador, right? They didn't say, oh, you're from Kentucky. You're going to go rep our whiskey around the United States. (laughs) How, How did you get into this position? So my husband and I were leaving the D.C. area, took a five-week road trip across the country and ended up in Seattle, started applying for jobs. And I saw this posting for a tasting room server at Woodenville Whiskey. And I was like, huh, that'd be kind of cool. I love whiskey. I love talking about whiskey. I've been in restaurants and hotels now the last five years, so maybe... Switching it up would be a good thing. And I, you know, bragged that I was from Kentucky and how much I loved whiskey during the interview and thankfully got the job and spent my whole first year with Woodenville in the tasting room, really living and breathing everything Woodenville, seeing how they distill because the tasting room's right off the production area. And then also answering as many questions as possible that people could come up with. So I really think that helped honed in the brand. 
But I was also going to as many bars and restaurants in Seattle as I could since I came from the food and beverage world and we wanted to explore as much as possible and was always telling Brett and Orlin, our founders, of the new places that I've been to or the new whiskey that I tried. And they were like, you know what? Um, we want you to be our first salesperson. And I was didn't think it was real at first. And I was like, this has got to be a joke. And then they were like, no, we really want you to get out there. You're already talking about Woodinville. So we think you'd be the perfect fit. And so that's how I started. And so at first it was just a regional sales role within Seattle, then went to the state of Washington. And then as we went to more states, first Northern California and Oregon, and then last year, Fimor, and this year, quite a few, I got to launch all those markets with our team. So it's been pretty awesome. So how many people are on that team right now? So we have um, my boss, who's the commercial development director. He's really the one crunching numbers behind the scenes, making sure each distributor in each different market has enough whiskey. And then um, I have six regional ambassadors that I manage to make sure that they have what they need from Woodinville. And then we can all, you know, preach the gospel, I guess, of Woodinville whiskey. And so they're in bigger markets where I can't be all the time. And I handle, I would say, more of the smaller markets in the Midwest right now. So how many states are you guys in right now? I believe it's 23 after we launched Alaska a week or two ago. That's that's reaching out there. Yes. Next year, I don't think we'll go to too many. Uh, but since we couldn't sell into a lot of bars and restaurants, we decided to go to a few more states this year. So did you launch Alaska? We did it virtually. I yeah. was very excited to go. It's one of, I think, 11 states I have left to go to. And so I was very excited. But that just means I'll have to go later. Yeah. So do you have a regional representative up there in Alaska since so, it's so disconnected from the... We don't have anyone that's living in Alaska. Our Washington ambassador, Desiree, will eventually be the person of contact for that. We try to give a few different markets to each ambassador so that they can really own it and make it their own. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the distillery itself. And, you know, what can uh, what can somebody expect if they're in uh, Washington state, maybe on vacation, maybe visiting family, uh, maybe just touring the nation in their motor home and they want to go out and check out the distillery. What can they expect on a visit to the distillery? Well, if they've been to a lot of Kentucky distilleries, it's going to look a little different. We don't have a bunch of acreage and rolling hills and all that, but the valley, that is Woodinville. So you'll come off the highway and cut through this nice little neighborhood and come down this large hill into the town of Woodinville, and it's a little green oasis 20 miles from downtown Seattle. You would never know that, you know, two minutes down the road, you're in suburbia because it's green and luscious. It used to be all agricultural land. And you're in a valley between two, I would say, good sized hills. They're not mountains yet at that point. And they're the distillery is right next to a tavern, one of the oldest buildings in the town of Woodinville. It's been a few things over the time. A gas station turned into just a beer and peanuts tavern, I guess. They had served canned beer and hot dogs on the rollers and all that. And now it's this American tavern that serves great hearty food, which is good if you've been drinking wine or whiskey all day. And then our distillery we built six years ago from scratch, but it looks like it's been in the town for a long time, which is nice. Very rustic. Uh, dark, like most architecture, I would say, in Seattle with our uh, black tin roof and all that. And then you'll walk straight into our tasting room, which we can host tastings without doing an educational experience beforehand, which is nice. And then to the right of the tasting room is our whole production area, which is going to look very different the next time most people come since we've been under expansion now the last six months. Now, is Washington a, a, a state that allows shipping of spirits? They can ship within the state of Washington, which okay. is nice, but would be more awesome if we could ship past state lines. <laughs> so if somebody is visiting the distillery from out of state, they've got to basically take it home in their luggage. Yes. Okay. Got it. Well, you know, in Kentucky, we just had a law passed here. Yes, so in July, right? Yeah. In July. Now it's not really that much in effect yet because it takes a while for you know, distilleries and shipping companies to ramp up to new laws. But yeah, we're kind of excited about it here that we're going to be able to ship out of the state of Kentucky. Yes, it'll be great for the direct to consumers for distilleries, getting people that may not sell that particular brand or whiskey in the market. You're probably going to get a call from Woodenville and say, hey, you're in Louisville. We want you to ship our product around the country. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll have my own little Woodenville pop up shop. <laughs> <laughs> we well, already have that, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you go in a liquor store here in Kentucky, they'll have it on the shelf, but you also have your nice, beautiful little stands you guys have. And it, it's what's the saying? Washington, Washington and Kentucky. I think it says Kentucky meet Washington. Meet Washington. Yeah. I thought that was a great, great slogan. Um, and I like that marketing piece. Uh, we were talking about your bottle off break and, uh, you'd said that somebody had said it was too old school. Um, to me, it speaks whiskey. Um, and sometimes it's not important what's the bottle looks like so much as what's inside the bottle. And even though this is a ride, Jim, and you're going to say, <laughs> yeah, said I want to, I want to hear your final word on this, Mike. Sixth ride that I would say, if listener, if you're out there and you're looking for a ride, I do think this is a great ride. Really sweet. If you, I think it's a great, like I said, dessert whiskey or after dinner whiskey. If you're looking for that sweetness, I think it'd make a great cocktail. Um, same price range. It is, uh, might be a dollar or two more and depending on the area that you're purchasing in. Still a great price. Um, go out there and pick it up. Try it. Try something different. If you're looking for something different, if you want to stick with the standard stuff, stick with that standard stuff. But I like a, something outside the box and this fits that. I think it's a beautiful expression. If I'm looking for that to feel that sweet tooth, that's probably what I'm going to go to because I can get that in Kentucky. So, yeah. Yes. And I bet this plays really well in cocktails. It plays really well. It's really awesome. I would say I have it more often than not in an old fashioned just because it's easy to make at home. Um, but of course, your classic Manhattans and Sazeracs, uh, even a whiskey smash, the rye plays really well in. What about a mule? A little bit too much spice for a mule, you think? I think it would play really well, especially if you put just that little dash of lime in it, mm -hmm. kind of cut that spice. What would you call that, Jim? It couldn't be called a Kentucky meal. What would you call it? Washington meal. Washington, Washington meal. meal. <laughs> I'm going to call it the honey meal. Yeah, we're getting silly now. <laughs> <laughs> well, so um, where can we find Woodenville Whiskey on social media? Yeah, so we are at Woodenville Whiskey Co. for Instagram. And uh, on our Facebook, I believe it's just facebook.com slash Woodenville Whiskey Co. And then if y'all want to find me, it's A Ray Yon, A R A E J A H N. One more time. Spell that out. A R A E J A H N. Got it. A Ray John. A Ray John. Yes. A Ray John. A Ray John. I could probably come up with something new, but I feel like at this point I've had it for, I guess, two years since I got married. It was A Ray Fleisch, my maiden name before. So hopefully we'll have your significant other, your husband, on at some point too with his job. In yes. the future, hint, hint, beer. A lot of beer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll have them on and um, get him on the show. And talk well, about we'd that. definitely like to invite you guys uh, when we release this podcast on the day of the release. We'd love for you to pop into the Bourbon Roadies. Perfect. And uh, say hey to all our roadies and say hey to our fans and the people that like to listen to the show on a regular basis. And um, they're, they're bound to have questions for you. Yes. Well, I love to answer questions. So that you can find the bourbon road. You can find us on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook at the bourbon road. You can find us at our website, the bourbon road.com and on the bourbon road.com. You'll find obviously the podcast. You can listen to it there. Uh, you can actually, there's a few links there where you can click on it and go listen to it on your favorite podcast player. We also have um, blogs that we write for each and every episode that we do. Uh, where we talk a little bit about our experience and, and, and about the podcast. So for those people who like to read a little bit in addition to listening, uh, we also have some swag on there. So if, uh, if you know, you need a new glass for your bar, definitely want to check out the bourbon road. Glenn Karen, what do you say, Mike? I think that's, you got to have one of those. If you're going to be in our bourbon roadies on Facebook, our private Facebook group, you got to have one of our Glenn Karen's, right? Go on there, buy one of those. You can show it with your whiskey and some photos and stuff. Join the Bourbon Roadies. We do great giveaways in there. Uh, the other roadies in there, they love to share their whiskey, don't they, Jim? They do share their whiskey. It's almost becoming uh, kind of the mantra of the Bourbon Roadies, right? I'd say so. Share your whiskey. You only got to ask answer three questions to get into the roadies. Are you old enough to drink? Do you like whiskey? Doesn't everybody? 
And do you agree to play nice? Because we don't tolerate no rudeness. No rudeness in the roadies. Yeah. So it don't matter where you're at your whiskey journey. If you're just starting or if you've been on your, that bourbon road for a long time, join us. Uh, me and Jim are always in there talking to everybody. Some great giveaways always happen. Um, but no selling. No selling. No no selling whiskey in there. Don't come in there if you're selling your whiskey. No. Unless you're a. You know, a, a distillery, of course. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Ariel, thanks for coming out to the farm tonight and being on the podcast with Jim and I. I really uh, appreciate it. I'm sure Jim does too. It's not every day that we get a national brand ambassador uh, sitting down with us. So I thought about it through the show. We've actually had a, a national brand ambassador before with Wilson. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. <laughs> so hopefully Wilson, and he's one of our listeners and he's a roadie, so. Yeah. So you can find me at One Big Chief on Instagram. I'm Jay Shannon 63. And we'll see you on down the Bourbon Road. We do appreciate all of our listeners, and we'd like to thank you for taking time out of your day to hang out with us here on the Bourbon Road. We hope you enjoyed today's show, and if so, We would appreciate if you'd subscribe and rate us a five-star with a review on iTunes. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Bourbon Road. That way you'll be kept in the loop on all The Bourbon Road happenings. You can also visit our website at thebourbonroad.com to read our blog, listen to the show, or reach out to us directly. We always welcome comments or suggestions. And if you have an idea for a particular guest or topic, be sure to let us know. And again, thanks for hanging out with us. 